Hello, everybody, and welcome to another evening of Northshire Live. For those of you who don't know me already, I am Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York, um, with my wonderful colleague Davith from Northshire's Manchester Center, Vermont location, hidden behind the camera, behind the scenes tonight, but uh, still here making sure everything runs smoothly. Um, before we get started, a couple of quick notes for you. Um, First of all, please use the either the Q&A function or the chat box to ask any questions that you have at any point throughout the evening. I will be interviewing our three guest authors, um, but I'm happy to intersperse your questions whenever we get them. So any questions that you have, um, please use that chat box or the Q&A box to ask them. Um, and then the only other note before we get started with the fun part is a huge thank you to all of you watching tonight. Um, it's been quite a year for independent book selling and independent businesses and authors, to be honest. Um, and all of us couldn't get through it without your support. Um, buying books matters. Um, buying books from independent bookstores matters. And the fact that we can all be here to present this event tonight is really thanks to you and that support. So we are incredibly grateful to you um, for continuing to support books, authors, and independent book selling. Um, so without further ado, I'm really excited to get to welcome these three amazing authors to our screens this evening. Um, I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order by last name because uh, they're all amazing and that was the best way I could come up with to do it. Um, Mona Schroff is with us tonight to talk about Then There Was You, a deeply heartfelt and emotional romance about two people healing each other. She's the, also the author of Then, Now, Always. Naima Simone has been publishing romance since 2009 and her work has appeared on the USA Today bestseller list. Her lovely small town romance, The Road to Rosebend, just came out and is the start of a new series set not too far from here in the Berkshires. And Sunithia Williams is with us tonight to talk about Careless Whispers, the fourth book in her fabulous Robidoux family series, a fabulously complicated family saga. Um, I'd like to start off with each of you telling us a little bit about your newest book. And Mona, if you don't mind, why don't you kick things off and then we can go in the order I just introduced the three of you. Oh, so I get to go first. First, I'd like you to do. thank you. I know, I'm so mean. <laughs> That's all good. It's all good. But thank you so much for having us. I think it's nice to be able to do virtual events if we can't do live ones just yet. Um, and um, I think we're all kind of getting a little bit of the hang of it. So it's great to be here with you. And um, if I ever make it to Sarasota, Spr Sarasota Springs, I'd love to I'd love to stop by. Yes, um, please do. <laughs> that being said, um, so thank you again for um, hosting and for anybody who's watching. Um, so my, this book, Then There Was You, I mean, I have it right here, here we go. Um, it's my second book and it is, um, it is about two people who have gone through a lot um, in their lives and, I kind of wrote this book with the idea of taking two people who had been through a lot and seeing if when they came together, what that would be like. And it turned out to be actually a book about, about that possibility, about hope. Um, and all our books are about love and that happily ever after. But um, when, when bad things happen, sometimes we forget about that hope. And I think that that's what I tried to portray here. So Daniel is a nurse practitioner and a flight helicopter medic because he's a workaholic. Um, so he doesn't have to think about the horrible thing that happened in his life. And Annika um, is just um, getting over actually a miscarriage and her fiance dumped her at the same time. And so she's kind of struggling with that and her new career and what to do with all of that when they kind of, they meet. Um, and then their story kind of goes from there and they have trials and tribulations like anybody does. Um, but it was, it was an interesting, um, journey for me to take just to kind of see how I could actually get, bring these people together and have, help them find happiness. And it is a tearjerker. I've heard it. it I cried while I was writing it. So I cried. Um, it, it's, I it's definitely cried a good it. cry. Yeah. It has a happy ending though. It ends well, everybody's happy. So, you know, it's not, it's not one of those, but you will cry on their journey with them. Yeah, no romance without a happy ever after. Right, mm -hmm. right. Just, not a romance if it doesn't yeah. happen. <laughs> and then Naima, I, why don't you go ahead and tell us about The Road to Rose Bend? Okay, so The Road to Rose Bend is uh, the first book in the Rose Bend series um, from HQN. And here it is. 
<laughs> so pretty. And it takes place in uh, the Southern Berkshires in Massachusetts. And the town rebel, Sydney Collins, is returning to Rose Bend, her hometown, after eight years. She could not wait to get out of town, right? Because she hated it, because she was like the rebel. You know, she's like the black sheep. So she's returning home and she's newly divorced and she's pregnant. And so, but she's returning home because she's like, she wants to give her, her baby this safe and a community, the community that even though she didn't really feel like she belonged there, she was like, she knows it's the best place to raise her child because it's a small town community uh, family. And that's what she wants for her child. So she's returning home. She has, it's kind of estranged from her family but she wants to make the best of it. But the first person she runs into is Coltrane Cole Dennison. Shout out to my father, who's the Coltrane, John Coltrane fan. And I'm giving him the son he never had through Coltrane Dennison. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so he's a widower and he's the town mayor and he's still grieving from losing his uh, wife and his son in childbirth. And, but he, he bumps into her and sparks fly, even though neither one of them wants the sparks to fly. But this is a friends to lovers romance. So even though they're fighting it and they're both like, no, no, we're just friends. Of course, you know, sparks are flying in their loins. So yeah, they're still, you know, gonna get together. And there's a marriage of convenience trope. So they're still going, oh, this is just for the benefit of the child. But of course we know that, you know, it's not. And so, things happen, they're still fighting it, but they're still so, just want each other so madly because listen, don't let the cover bridge fool you. There's sex in this book and it's hot. And so they get together, but they're still like, he's still grieving. So there has to be a lot of healing, redemption, and they have to overcome a lot to get together, but they do. Cause like Mona said, it's a romance, happily ever after. And I hope tears, cause I want tears, okay? I don't think I cry because I have a heart of, you know, stone, even though I'm a romance writer, but you know, I, I want you to. So yeah, there it is. All three of the tonight's books actually made me cry at one point or another. So, uh, I, and I mean, I'm easy, but they, you all got me. So, <laughs> um, Sunithia, why don't you go ahead and tell us about Careless Whispers? Sure, so Careless Whispers, uh, this is it is the fourth book in my Jackson Falls series. And it follows um, a wealthy influential family in North Carolina. And Elena Robidoux is the oldest child. And she's been promised that she would take over the family business. She's uh, lived her whole life following the rules that her parents put upon her, rules that were quite unfair fair to her about not believing in love and not being vulnerable and not trusting people, which led her to make a lot of bad mistakes. And um, she has her nemesis, um, Alex Tyson at her job, who was brought in to kind of help lead a section of the company, but was always kind of a threat of, we can always replace you with him, even though you're a family. And so she and Alex uh, kind of go back and forth. You see a little bit of that in the other books in the series, but when it comes to a head, her father fires her. And she's kicked out of the company that she has dedicated her whole life and sacrificed so much to do. But in order, she picks herself up, she's going to start a new business. But in order to do that, she needs the help of her nemesis. <laughs> she needs the help of his father to, um, to help her start her new business. And so her and Alex end up working together. She slowly... Um, warms up to him he sees past the cold heart shell that she put up to protect herself and he uh takes his time to go through that so elena is a very hard no nonsense prickly kind of heroine and alex is the he's he's still strong and firm he doesn't you know he doesn't take her crap but he's also knows to be patient and how to approach her and so as she grows and comes to terms with what love really means um, he's there for her. And, and obviously we have the happily ever after at the end. So <laughs> that's what happens in uh, Careless Whispers. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, I loved his yeah. gentleness. Yeah. Um, he approached her, it was really lovely. Um, so all three of these romances are, as we sort of covered, you know, definitely on the angsty end of the romance spectrum. 
you know, they've all, all of your, your characters are dealing with some pretty heavy stuff, you know, from unplanned pregnancy to alcoholism, to loss of a child, you know, there, there's a lot going on in all three of these books. Um, and you all manage to avoid the trap that sometimes comes up in romance novels of sort of too much being solved by the magical power of the other person's love, um, which is one of the things that when it happens in romance novels, it always like, that's me a little bit on edge. Um, and I wondered if you each had a plan going into the writing of this particular novel about how you'd handle those heavy loads and avoid that particular trap. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I know with, <clears throat> with Elena from the very start of the series, I had a lot of people, readers who would, you know, say, uh, can, she really worth it. And so I really wanted <laughs> to to focus on people seeing that, you know, if you may have that hard character, that person who's perceived as a AKA bitch or whatever, but there's reasons behind that. And I wanted to show the reasons behind that. And I wanted to show her overcoming that, not just because she fell in love and, and found a, a great man, um, but I, I wanted to show her going through that process of learning, unlearning the stuff that um, had been drilled into her head for such a long time, because, you know, Love doesn't necessarily take away all the stuff that's been drilled into your head since you were a kid. Uh, so that's kind of how I approached it. And I, I, I thought I wasn't putting a lot of drama because I, I felt like, you know, she didn't need a bunch of extra stuff after your father fires you and gives the job to your nemesis. But it still turned out to be kind of dramatic and angsty um, as they moved on. But I, I also wanted a character to compliment her, um, not necessarily just to challenge her, um, but someone who could show her it's okay to trust, but she has to ultimately make that decision. And that's kind of how I approached it. I really so, loved how complicated she is. So thank you for that. Thank you. I think I was determined from the beginning that it wouldn't end that way. Like it wouldn't end that just because they fell in love, um, all their problems would go away. Um, I, I think that's, I mean, I don't think anybody, I don't think that's how it works. And I don't think anybody's buying that even in, even a romance book. I mean, you know what I mean? There's a lot of things people will take from a romance book. That's just not one of them. And, um, yeah, so like, so Daniel's dealing with the loss of a child and he's, he enters the story that way. So when he falls in love with Annika, um, I, I'm hoping the reader knows even right then that it's not going to work right away because that's not, he thinks it solves all his problems because he's fallen in love with her. Um, and I did write them. I don't know what the ages of, 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 of all the heroines are, but I tend to write like late twenties, early thirties, mid thirties, a little bit older um, because I like working with the characters where they're not, they're, it's not so much like that teenage angst, like teenage angst is great in YA. Um, but I didn't, you know, it's, it's, it, they're a little bit more mature. They're, they're a little bit more sure of like a little, even though they're trying to find themselves, they kind of aren't doing that little petty thing where like, oh, well, you didn't sit with me on the bus. I mean, if he didn't sit with you on the bus and you're 30 years old and that bothers you, there better be a damn good reason, but that it's bothering you. Like you have bus trauma or something. Right. But, um, so I kind of tried to back it up that way, but like, I never, I wouldn't have bought that ending. So, um, I did go into it, I think, deciding that, I didn't know, and I never really know, but I, I was hoping that I was going to be able to come up with a, a real reason for them to actually fall in love. Like, so they have to actually do the work themselves before they come to, before they can actually come together. And it's more for Daniel than Anna, but it's also for her too. She has to deal with her shit. Sorry. Um, before <laughs> I know what words we're allowed to use. <laughs> um, before they can actually come together. And so they, you know, um, so I hope it's, I do hope it's a satisfying um, <laughs> ending. I just saw the chat, <laughs> plus trauma. <laughs> I did, I, sometimes you just say things and you don't really know it's gonna come out. Um, but yeah, so that, I, I think I did have a plan for that um, when I was doing the sim similar to Sinidia. I think I just fell in love with Mona all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, for me, with, with Sydney, she, she had issues, well, family issues, and so she had to learn to love herself, and when you 
have to learn to love yourself and accept yourself. And it doesn't matter if somebody else's love you, if somebody else loves you, because you have to learn to see the worth and value in yourself. And so before she accepted somebody else's love, she had to do that first. So somebody else's love wasn't gonna be the magic answer. And as for Cole, he had love. So somebody else, so her love was actually a threat to him. It was his biggest fear. And so that was their obstacle. And he had to come to accept her love. So their conflict for him was her falling in love with him. So yeah, that's my answer. And I'm going to be really unprofessional for a second, but my daughter is coming home from cheerleading practice and I have to go unlock the door for her because she just texted You do that, that, okay, that matters. So sorry. No, no, no we worries. understand. So, <laughs> but we all, I think all of us on this call have kids and have been You there. the ring curtain. <laughs> nice. Um, so I actually have one more question for all three of you, but I'll save that for when Naima is back and ask a question um, specifically for Mona. Um, Mona, I really enjoyed how important family relationships are to both Annika and Daniel, even when they're pretty complicated. And I loved how that translated into the ways that their relationship evolved in terms of meeting each other's families. Um, was that part of the book fun to write for you? Because it seemed really fun. Like a lot of those relationships were, were complicated and interesting and, and it was yeah, very satisfying yeah, I, to read. I, I love writing the supporting cast, so to speak. Um, and, and, it, and it generally is family because, um, you know, no one's an island. Like, you know, two people fall in love and I've been married for almost 28 years and anybody who's been married for any amount of time or been, you know that when you come together as a couple, your families are there too, for better or for worse. Whether they get along or not, you know, it, that's the whole, they're still there. They're going to share grandchildren, they share whatever children you have, everybody shares, right? So it's, it's still a family, regardless of what kind of ties you have going on there. Um, and I think sometimes that's what makes, that's where your influences are. Those are the things that you can't control in your life. Um, and, but it, it affects your life and it adds to your life positively or negatively um, some way or other. Um, and I love, like I particularly liked writing Annika and her brother um, I liked writing that relationship because it mirrors the relationship that my daughter and my son have and possibly even the same relationship that I have with my brother. Um, um, and even like with parents and things like wh where you come from and your thoughts about like in Cynthia's book about love and everything tend to come from what you've seen growing up or what you've been told growing up um, or even like the aunties that are around, you know, like everything has influence on you one way or another. And I, I always find it really enjoyable um, to write that. And Daniel's situation was unique because he sort of shut down after he lost his child. Um, but his sister just kept reaching out, kept reaching out, kept reaching out um, as sisters do, um, just to make sure he was eating and all that kind of thing. And he's, he has a different relationship with his parents. And, um, and that was different than what Annika had. So it was nice. It, it was fun for me to kind of see how all of those people would affect their, their relationship and their growth arc, so to speak, and their growth as characters. So yeah, I do, I do really like writing that. Thank you. It was, it, as I said, it was very fun to read. Um, so back to a question really for all three of you. Um, we were talking earlier about how, you know, these books all address pretty serious issues. Um, but you all managed to do that without them feeling heavy, you know, without the reader ever feeling sort of depressed or bogged down. Um, and that's a really big craft accomplishment. You know, that's a, a hard thing to do. Was that something that had ha had to be sort of conscious effort in the revision process, or did that was that always sort of part of part of the drafting process from the beginning? Uh, for me, it was uh, conscious from the beginning, especially dealing with death. Um, you, you don't want it to take over. It's, it also, it changes the hero. Like, you know, it changes who he was, especially because people, especially his family talked about who he used to be. And when the book opens, you see who he is now. And of course it changes who he is, but you don't want it to bog down the book. At least I didn't, you know, you, I didn't want it to bog down the book and take over the romance part, but it is actually part of the story because it's part of what he has to overcome. But you know, the focus is always the romance between the hero and the heroine. So even though it's 
part of the story, it can't take over the story. So I always had to keep that in mind and sometimes kind of like draw it back because I can get wordy. And so, <laughs> and then in edits, of course, sometimes my editor had to be like, yeah, you're getting too emo. So I had, you know, so sometimes it had to get, some things had to get cut, but yeah, actually, but most of the part, most of the time, yeah, it was, it was a conscious effort to not let it take over the story. I, I would agree with that. I think um, because uh, you know where we start the story, the trauma has already happened, and they've already been doing grieving for however long they have been, and so the story we're telling is how they're going to move past that. Mm -hmm. So we are starting this. We're we're, te we're not talking about what already happened. Like I mean, we are, but that's not what the story is. The story isn't the moment that all this death happened. The story is. It happened, this is who they are now, who are they going to be moving forward? Um, and they are heavy topics. And there was more than once where I was like, God, is it too heavy? You know, um, but I think I did what Naima did without even really considering it. I'm writing a romance book. It's really a, a story about these two people and, and how they're gonna overcome what has already happened to them. Yeah, it was it was a conscious decision as I was going through it. Now the book I wrote during a pandemic. Oh, I can't wait to see those ads because yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> but I wrote Careless Whispers before the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> so it was easier to like weed stuff out, but I, I tried to be conscious of it. And then the other thing that I tried to do so when um, Elena would talk about what happened to her in her past or even dealing with the miscarriage she had suffered when she was previously married. I did those scenes from Alex's point of view. I know a lot of times it's like, do the scene from the person who has the most to lose and in and, and those scenes, that's her being vulnerable. But instead I wanted to flip it to so, so he could see he could see and appreciate her admitting this stuff and her being vulnerable. And so you see it, how he accepts her and how he understands how hard it is for her to open up and say this kind of stuff. And that he gives her the, the space she needs to talk about this without judgment um, so that she can feel comfortable. And so I, I consciously wanted to write the scenes where she, some of those scenes where she had to touch on some of the really hard stuff from her past from his point of view, so that you could see him accepting her as she is, you could see him processing that um, and recognizing what a gift it was that she actually was willing to talk to him when she wouldn't talk to other people. It also lets the reader experience it at a level of remove too. That's really interesting. I, I hadn't mm -hmm. noticed that you did that, but it makes perfect sense now, now that you describe it, but that yeah. would really change the tone of those scenes. Yeah. Um, so since you mentioned pandemic writing, um, I'm curious, this might be a mean question, um, but how all three, what all three of you have been working on in the last year and, and what's coming next? Um, and a general question that I have for a lot of authors, which I'm very curious about that's sort of related to that, do you ever plan to address the pandemic in your writing or will, you know, 2020 and 2021 just be the years that never happened in, in, your, in your work? <laughs> black hole years, <laughs> which they sort of are. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, um, it was hard. I wrote Foolish. The next book in the series is Foolish Hearts. It comes out this summer. And I wrote that during the pandemic. And and so that's the one that's going to be like, oh, I hope she let that stay because it's kind of <laughs> heavy. But um, <laughs> but um, I now as I'm working on newer projects, I want to put in some of the stuff that I do now through a pandemic. I want to be like she put on her mask because now it's just like second nature to me, but there's no pandemic in the book. So it wouldn't make sense for her to do some of the pandemic things. Um, right now, I, I probably want, I want to just write these worlds and then maybe later address the pandemic. But right now, they it doesn't exist in my current projects. Yeah, I, I wrote... Um my third book during the pandemic and it was a, it's a it's coming out I think next year it's about a, a vet and an, and a female Indian woman firefighter um, and that's what I wrote in 2020 um, and in terms of addressing the pandemic I think I have some like I'm writing new stuff right now and I'm just not putting a year on it because um, I don't really want to address like well like my current work in progress takes place at a wedding 
over the course of five days. And if, if I do it in a pandemic, I, I can't, right? Um, also, I feel like it'll take a little bit of time. I think it's too soon. I do feel like it's, I think we, ha I think eventually I will address it um, once we've had some distance from it because the world is gonna change in certain ways inexplicably. We may go back to not wearing masks. Or we may always wear masks in certain areas, right? Um, so, you know, not to be macabre, but like going back to like 9-11, like when you wanna get on an airplane, so pre 9-11, you could go to the gate, right? You could have that romantic scene at the gate. Um, but if you wrote that now, like everybody would be like, what, what do you mean going to the gate? Like my kids don't even know what the heck that means to go to the gate, right? Like they've never gone to the gate. So you can't write that anymore. So you're not really writing about 9-11, but you're writing about how you had to like drop off or security or all that, like that, like your airport experience is different than it was 20 years ago. Um, so I feel like in that way, eventually we'll have to like address it because the world will just be a different place and we'll address it that way. But I've talked to even some of like my family that they are like, we don't want to read about masks and stuff right now. We, we want to forget that there's a pandemic, you know, we don't want that. So I haven't written about it quite yet. I'm not planning on it right now, but I think eventually we'll have to address it like somehow. Yeah, Early, as as, oops, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, you 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 go ahead. I was just going to say early on in the pandemic, we had an event with an author who had written a book about the 1918 flu. And he said that in the literature that came out after the 1918 flu, there was almost no mention of it. It basically, and he, his theory about that was both that people didn't want to hear about it and writers didn't want to think about it. You know, it was this horrible thing that happened and it was over and thank God it was over. And that was basically the way writers didn't address it. Um, but go ahead, Naima. I'm sorry for, for cutting in like that. Oh, no, no, it's no problem at all. Um, I agree with everything Mona said. Actually, I hadn't uh, thought of that. And that's true as far as how we deal with like 9-11 with the airport and everything. That's very true. So I suppose... Uh, there'll come a time where we will address uh, that uh, pandemic like that. But as for now, um, I don't plan on writing about it because I wrote The Road to Rose Bend during the pandemic. Like it had just started when I was writing it. And the, my book that came out in February, I wrote smack in the pandemic. And so I had no mention of them. I don't plan. And then I wrote the book that's coming, the, the holiday book that's coming out. I wrote that right in the middle of the pandemic. And I just don't plan on writing it about it or including any of my worlds anytime soon because um, I want to write about escape and in the books that I read, I want to read to escape like reality. So I don't want to kind of read about reality. And even though I will say that I've read a couple of romances that have included the pandemic, like Theodora's Quarant Theodora Taylor's Quarantales, and it was fantastic. So there are some people who do it fantastically. I just don't think I can do it as fantastically without making it Lord of the Rings. So I'm going to stay away from it. <laughs> Lord of the Rings pandemic, I, I would like to read. <laughs> Mine wouldn't be as good though. So <laughs> That's true. Uh, well, I don't know. We don't know. You might have a secret fantasy writer in you. You never know. It would take um, a lot of Benadryl. <laughs> So we got a question from an audience member um, asking all of you, what are some conventions of the genre, of the romance genre that you embrace and what are some that you avoid in your writing? As far as conventions, I'm not sure I understand. Or maybe, maybe, maybe tropes of romance that you particularly like and ones that you particularly dislike and maybe both as a reader and a writer. Okay, I'll, okay, listen, there's one. There are two, there are two. And not because I dislike them. Because I'm just like, my mind is not scientific. Uh, I went, when I was in college, I was, a I was a social science major because it required as little math and science prerequisites as possible. <laughs> so that in mind, anything that has to do with amnesia or time travel, I stay away from <laughs> because I'm gonna get it wrong. So, and I know in anything medical, because somebody's going to check me and I'm going to get it wrong. So anything with amnesia or 
anything medical, time travel, even though I love a good amnesia book and a good time travel book. I'm just not going to write it because I'm not going to get it right. I'm going to get tripped up with the science and the math. <laughs> amnesia is one of those ones that's really hard to get right in terms of yes. consent. You know, it yes. can be yeah. done. It can be but done. It can Kylo go Scott really badly wrong. Fantastically. But yeah, not me. Mm -mm. They're yeah, like, it, girl, that's science fiction. <laughs> you, did, <laughs> you did not get that right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, Cause I, I, I pretty, I, I enjoy reading some people's romantic suspense, but I don't think I would ever want to do it because I feel like I'm a mess up police procedure. And even though I put drama and mystery and mystery adjacent in some of my books, I won't even say all. Um, I just don't think I want to jump full fledged into, you know, police proceedings and DNA sampling and contaminating. Like they're going to be like, this, 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 this scene is messed up. They can't use this information. So you completely ruin that. Um, but, but I like I like most of the conventions in romance. I love that it has a, a happily ever after. I know what I'm going to get when I go pick up a romance novel. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love it. And so I don't, I'm not going to play into the, oh, well, it has romance, but the ending, somebody dies and that's still romance. You know what? No, no sorry. No. Sorry, it's not. It's no. not you want that go read that but don't call it romance it just has a romantic element in it but I, i'm just not gonna co-sign on that so. <laughs> yes absolutely that is and i think that's part of why romance has been so popular this year you know i think people have needed that guaranteed happy mm -hmm. ending very badly and i think always in hard times people turn to that yeah yeah um i I love, and I didn't know I loved it until someone asked me to list my favorite movies and they were all that fake relationship, fake engagement, whatever. Um, clearly this is what I like. Um, so I'm writing one right now, kind of like a fake marriage. Um, and it's more fun to read it. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping I pull it off. Okay. Cause I'm like, I, I come committed to it now. Um, but I, I, I like, most of the tropes, I think, in uh, romance, and uh, like Cynthia says, I, I absolutely love the um, H, the happily ever after. Um, as far as romantic suspense or something, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that I, I would, I would delve into that. That being said, I've always, I have the idea for like a thriller in the back of my head, which has nothing to do with romance, but that's just an idea that popped into my head as I was doing it like a contest one time and. Um, so that's there. Um, but um, in terms of romance, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll read anything like once and see, you know, how, how I like it. <laughs> I don't know if I'll write it. Do, do the fake marriage. I can't wait to read how you do that. Cause yeah. that's gonna be so angsty. So yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let, 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 let's hope it comes out good. <laughs> <laughs> I know it will. <laughs> So we've got a question uh, from Kat um, asking a great question. What is the best or most valuable edit you've received on one of your recent books? Oh. <laughs> Maybe it's a too tough a question. <laughs> so I'll say my, I only have the two out right now. So I'm in, I'm in, I'm in edits for book three. And um, so my debut, I probably got the most valuable edits on my debut because I had such a lot to learn at that point in time. And um, my editor at HQN is amazing. And, and she basically, and this may not be the, the kind of answer you're looking for, but like I basically had like not time travel, but I had two timelines. So I had like when they first met and fell in love and she got pregnant because that was my secret baby trope. Um, and then I had the main timeline where they're, 16 years later and now she needs help. The mom needs help and she never even told him she had a baby type of thing, right? Um, and so I, I think I got, I got some really good advice on how to make those two flow together as opposed to making it chunky or whatever. So she was really good in helping me figure out the timelines and how to integrate it into the story. So it felt more like one story as opposed to feeling like two stories because you kind of had to know what happened then so that you could appreciate what happened now, but 
it was more fun to go for me to tell it to go back and forth so I guess storytelling and I guess she did help me the second book so in general just how to present like that how to present that story like where to start I, I think she I, I'm learning now like I know where to start but not always but um, with then there was you she was like okay chapter five the first four chapters are gone you start at chapter five like that's where you start um, and I don't think she's wrong I don't think she was wrong at all no. well I think um, like with my most recent edit I, I think that was more story specific but the one that just really comes to mind I think that just had the the um most valuable editorial advice that I got that just had the most impact over my career was um, early on where I wrote a lot of filters and I didn't realize that I did it. And my editor at the time pointed out that I wrote with a lot of filters and um, with filters, that's like, she felt sad or mm -hmm. she, felt this or, you know, instead of just saying, you know, what she felt is, you know, instead of just take the felt out and just said what she felt and it deepened the point of view. And I didn't realize that I was distancing the reader from my writing by adding in those filters. And let me tell you, I had to do a, almost a complete rewrite by taking out those filters because I didn't realize that I did that through the entire manuscript. But by her pointing out that I did that in my writing, it absolutely improved my writing from that point on. And, from, and I absolutely do not do that anymore. And even as when I, when I read or if I'm doing critiques, I can help other writers with that. And I point that out. It absolutely helped me as a writer with a deepening point of view, with getting inside my character's heads, with um, just really connecting with my character and helping readers connect with my character. So that was the best editorial advice I ever received as a writer. Yeah, I would agree with you, uh, Naima. And it was it was with Forbidden Promises, the first book in the series. And I remember <laughs> I got my edit back and I was like, all right, this is HQN. They're about to tell me how to make the story and you know, tell me about the plot and what I need to do. And like most of the edits were, but how does this feel? Make me feel, and that's how I read it in my head. It was like, yeah. how does this feel? What is this like? Give me, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm exhausted emotionally trying to pull all this out. This is too hard. But, <laughs> but then it came out and then some of my longtime readers were like, this is your best book that you, you know, out of all the books. And I was like, oh, okay. So now I think about that more, maybe not in the first draft, but um, as I'm revising, I think more about, you know, that and trying to pull that stuff out. And another real easy one, which I think we all probably enjoy, is when we write something and we don't know if it's going to hit. And then our editor gives us like a smiley place or LOL. Oh my God, this, yes. Right? You feel like you or, Yeah, or this is so hot. Like that stuff is so awesome because when we're writing it, we're like, I think this, this is fine. But then when your editor sends that back and you're like, oh, this made it so much easier to do the rest of these 300 pages. So uh, those are the two. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So we've got another really tough question from the audience. The audience is on fire with, with awesome tough questions tonight. Um, Emily asks, what are the most important aspects of a romantic relationship to focus on when you're writing? I told you it was hard. Yeah. Good, but hard. I think the characters dictate that to some extent. Um, in in some books, you may need to, to focus on the intimacy between them. Some books, communication may need to be more important. Um, so I, I think as I'm doing my character analysis and I'm figuring out who they are and what it would take for them to fall in love specifically and what a good relationship for them would look like, that's what I focus on as I write. So um, I wish I could give you a magic formula, um, but <laughs> that's my answer. Is I, I have to look at the characters to figure it out. I, I totally agree with that because I think mm -hmm. romance is character driven and um, we write, they're different people and, and it takes me the longest to figure out who they are. Once I figure out who they are, then the words come, but it takes forever for me to figure. And then even when the words are coming, they're changing. Um, 
but yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I wouldn't have been able to put it any better. I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Like it, it depends, it comes from the characters and you want to see, I do have to be able to see how they are with each other at their happily ever after. You know, I have to be able to see almost the epilogue. So I know what the, where they're going to be and where they're going to go. And once I'm satisfied with that, then, then the rest of it kind of, um, it doesn't, it doesn't just magically come together. I wish it did, but it doesn't. Okay, I'm, I'm going to co-sign and I'm glad you yeah. went first because that made this a whole lot easier to answer. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm, I'm going to co-sign because I, before I start writing, I actually do character sketches and I write out everything about the hero and the heroine from their age to how they look to their childhood to just even little details that don't make it on the page to like how they take their coffee to their issues their flaws what they need and then from there I can decide what they need from each other and even though like I might reuse you know the same tropes because there are certain tropes that I just love to write and you'll see like in my books you can probably tell which ones I love to write but the characters make the stories different and using those character sketches and knowing my characters inside and out, then they'll determine as I write like what they need from each other. Um, it'll determine how they have sex. It'll determine what they need in those quiet moments. It'll determine how they break up in the black moment, how they'll have their grand gesture, how they'll, you know, how they argue, how they'll um, be vulnerable with each other, you know, how they are with their family. It determines all of that. So you know, so I, I definitely agree with Sanithi and, and Mona. The characters are the key elements to um, relationships, emotion, sex, plot, all of that. You guys all handled that very hard question like the amazing <laughs> professionals that you are. Um, why we get paid the big bucks. It is, exactly. It's why you're here and I'm just asking questions. Um, so another tough one, actually, um, and this is an anonymous question. Um, oh, Lord, tips really for tough. coming up with titles. <laughs> Somebody else. You know, it's the hardest part I hear. Wait, <laughs> so many times. Ask your editor. That's my tip. Yes. Ask your editor. <laughs> I, we bring, my editor and I and my agent, we brainstorm on titles and, and we, it goes back and forth and it goes back and forth until literally I think one of us just gives in and we're like, all right, that's good. Let's just do it. <laughs> I, I, I this is how my title process goes. My editor emails me and says, okay, time for titles. This yeah. is what I was thinking. What do you suggest? I send her title. She says, great. Then she sends me, emails me back weeks later. This is a title and it's none of what I suggested. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good thing because I stink at titles. <laughs> I, I mean, we go I back hate writing titles. Yeah. Never good. So we're going back and forth from my book three right now, and like we have a working title, and then I'm like, what about this one? I thought like it's not in stone yet, so I'm like, I just thought of another one. So I don't even know who gets to win. I just at so, we just go back and forth. I'm like, whatever. What what do you think is gonna sell? Like honestly, at some point, I'm like, whatever. I'm writing another book. So. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I hate titles. I don't know. I, I don't know how to come up with them. So usually it's just like book one or whatever, <laughs> but I'm writing it. And then, hey, send me, what are y'all thinking? Tell me what the people who are going to put it on the shelves are thinking. And, and I then, can and then don't you, it. don't you forget, like, not that I forget what the names of the books are, but then I mean, I only have two and I, so I have that third one, but it's easier for me to remember if I just call it like, that's the Sam and Maya story. And that's yep. Daniel and Annika's story. You mean that one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Literally the book that's coming out in August, I wrote it. I had COVID, caught COVID when I wrote it. Oh, so literally oh. for like three months, it was the COVID book. That's all I remember the name <laughs> until my editor was like, this is the title. Oh, this is the title of the COVID book? Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> right? I love that because there's not even COVID in your book. It's, like, it's not even COVID in the book, but it's, it will always be the COVID book. I love it. <laughs> Forever and ever. I love ever. it. I love it. <laughs> and code names for the books are not a bad idea, actually. And, you know, you can, you can call it terrible things. <laughs> it's making you miserable. 
Um, so I had a bunch of individual questions for you, and I asked Mona one of those at the beginning of the evening, and I realized I never got back to either of you, Naima, or to I'm going to ask each of you an individual question, then we can get back to more general ones. Um, Naima, I really loved that the town of Rosebend almost feels like a, a full-fledged character in the book. It's its own personality. Um, where did you draw inspiration for the town itself? And was it exciting to sort of do a small town romance as a, as a subgenre? Because I, I don't think you had done a small town romance before. I, I hadn't. And it was really exciting because, um, I mean, I've set books in like smallish towns, but being able to do this is my first single title and be, being able to write this like a full fledged small town with its own unique characters was really fun. Like I had a whole list going in a notebook. And if you look at it, it, it has names and it'll literally say like uh, so and so town gossip, so and so. Uh, church lady, you know, things like that, like because the small towns have their unique characters and that's what makes them so much fun and so much fun to write. And I got the idea from from Thomas Kincaid, like I've, I've been in love with his paintings forever. And he was my inspiration to when I was imagining what this town looked like. And of course, Hallmark, because I'm a Hallmark junkie. And so I watch Hallmark Christmas movies every year. And I said, if I'm going to write a small town, this is the best excuse in the world to binge on Hallmark Christmas movies and had get no lip from nobody because I could just say I'm researching. And I just took notes, just notes. This is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. And, and, I, and I put it all, I threw everything into the book just because I could. <laughs> and and it, and they left it all, and I was so happy. <laughs> and it's I'm really still adding as I go. Like every book, I've I've added another character, or added another store, or some other element to it. It really does sound delightful. Thank um, you. And speaking of Hallmark, we were once at a romance event in the store. One of the authors told me that she found Saratoga Springs to be one bearded lumberjack short of a Hallmark Christmas. <laughs> So if you ever get a chance to visit. Oh, it's just, you, now it's just a re another reason to go. Exactly. Come see us and see if you agree with that. <laughs> um, so Sunithia, um, this is the fourth book in the Robodu family series. And I really enjoyed the cameos from some of the previous couples in the series. Um, when you're writing a series like this, do you find yourself getting attached to the characters? And, and is it sort of exciting to get to figure out how they're going to show up in later books in the series? Sometimes, but usually I'm already thinking about the next book and I'm like so done with these characters. <laughs> By the time I finish the book, like I'm just done with Zoe and whatever, Brock, what is it? Whatever, I forgot his name already. Yeah, so it's like I forget the names from the previous books. I'm having one of those brain moments, whatever you call it. Um, it was a little bit easier to bring them back in Careless Whispers since they are related and his family and, and the family dynamics and the family drama played such a big role in all of the books. So it was, it was uh, fun to bring them back. And in Careless Whispers, I really also wanted to show how her relationship with her family, you know, they view her a certain way and you see Elena a certain way in the other books. And I wanted you to see how she views them and how her interactions with them can be perceived differently. So in the other books, you may see Elena as being kind of a bitch, but when you're reading her story, you realize, you know, that's just a shell she puts up. This is her defense mechanism and, and the triggers that cause her to put that up and how she tries to work through that. So, so it made it, they were, they were needed <laughs> even more so in Careless Whispers to kind of show that part of her. Nice. Um, we've got another uh, actually very fun anonymous audience question um, asking, post pandemic, if you could travel to any one place for upcoming book research, where would you choose? Anywhere in Europe. <laughs> oh I just want to travel. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, Italy would be great. Spain would be great. Anywhere that's not Maryland would be great. <laughs> It's not my house. <laughs> um, yeah, I would. I, I would go to Scotland. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, just want, I really want to go. I've I've never been, and I've I always I had a chance to go, and and I didn't. 
and I, I just want to go, you know, and uh, so that that's on my bucket list that and to go back to London. Mm -hmm. So I got I got two. Um, one would be to Seoul, South Korea, because you can probably see K-pop stuff behind me. And so I just need to go and be like, hey, have you oh seen Park Thing or whatever? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, so, yeah, so that though, I don't know if that'll go in a book and it's probably just me fangirling. But um, I also wouldn't mind going to like Ghana or somewhere because I have a, you know, in the way back of my brain, like, hey, let's do Black Panther, but like T'Challa has sex, right? <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, he can save the world, but like, let's, we, we want him to have sex too. So mm -hmm. I would love to, you know, maybe go to Ghana or somewhere like that and, and mm -hmm. do some research and then, you know, write my, you know, King T'Challa actually gets laid in <laughs> story. Where can we get this? Where can we get this? I mean, did you, can you start that now? I know. <laughs> I would why love are you to. still talking? Can we, why are you not writing? <laughs> I think your market research is done. There's clearly an audience for this book, Sydney. I mean, so, yeah. so, you know, just saying. Get to it. What sells itself? I'm going to need you to pitch it just like that. I want to change my answer. I want to go to Africa. Too. Seriously, wait, 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 wait. I'm just like... <laughs> We're going to go together. Group trip. And it's research. It. It'll be research. It'll be yeah. like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's right. Those, that they write those connected series. Boom. Boom. <laughs> this, this is a multi. This is a multi-author continuity. We yeah, all right. Yeah. This is yeah. connected yeah. series. Yeah. All three of us need to go. <laughs> and as a book-selling professional, I can say there's definitely a market for this. Um, <laughs> and I'll need I, someone I, to talk to the folks at Harlequin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sadly we are shockingly close to uh, out of time because i could spend all evening talking to the three of you um, and i think our audience could spend all evening listening to the three of you so i thought we could wrap up um with a question um which i'd love to ask romance authors in particular because i love how romance authors support each other and each other's work um and i wondered First of all, what you three have been reading that you loved lately, and then also if there are any authors that you feel really sort of lifted you up as you were starting your writing career that you'd like to give a shout out to. Oh, wow. So I'm currently reading um, Accidentally Engaged by Farah Haron, who is actually an agency sibling, as is Naima. And, um, and I'm really enjoying it. It's a fake engagement. <laughs> it's a wrong <laughs> Um And Far has been um, Far and I kind of started together. Um, so that that's the book I'm reading right now. I I, I can't read too much because I'm drafting right now, and that's the hardest part. And and if I if I have a book that I love, any anything will distract me. So I I can't read too much right now. But I do have um, as one of my carrots out there are the a couple of Sonali Dave books um, that I'm waiting for. And she's actually, her book, um, she's actually one of the authors I would say that, um, you know, helped me out when I was, I am still just starting out. I mainly only have two books out. Like I'm still still getting there. Um, Nisha Sharma has been helpful. Falguni Kothari, Shayla Patel. I mean, I could just list a bunch of ladies that um, through, it, it's a whole other webinar actually, like, how people lift you up. I could I could do a whole hour on who has helped me and who has lifted me up and my beta readers who I'm like, hey, I'm on deadline. Can you turn this around in a week? That'd be great. Thanks. Bye. Um, and they do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody right now. Um, but these were people who um, just showed me the way, have called me up and been like, hey, maybe you don't want to put that in your book. Okay, maybe I don't want to. Um, or hey, maybe you want to look at this again, you know, that kind of thing, or uh, brainstormed with me. Um, Farah has brainstormed with me more than once. Shayla has brainstormed. I text Shayla and I'm like, I'm freaking out. Like, I don't know what's happening. So um, they're all wonderful, wonderful ladies. And if there's any, I, I'm going to think about it and I'm sure I'll come up with a hundred more, but yeah. Awesome. I'm reading um, The Single Mom's Second Chance by Kathy Douglas. Um, 
because the, the, the um, categories have been really easy for me to read when the, since the pandemic has struck. You know, they're like my perfect little candies. And I've been um, devouring a lot of those. Um, and if anybody knows me or has followed me, you probably see that I shout out to the Desta Divas and Farrah Rashawn, who originally brought us together back in like 2015. It was supposed to just be a writing retreat to talk about plotting. And then so many of those ladies have become um, such good friends. And I wouldn't have written the series if it wasn't for the divas of talking it out. I don't think anybody wants to read this. Help her write that book, you know, and and black Broughton brainstorming it with me and, and everything else. And, and so, you know, shout out to her for pulling us together and then to the rest of the ladies for just being that support system for the past five or six years. Um, well, right now I'm reading Tack by Ivy Harper, which is book three in the A-Hole Club series. And Ooh. yes, and it's Blue Sapphire's A-Hole Club series. And oh my God, so good. I love Blue Sapphire. And she's brought together some amazing ladies to write this series. And this third book is just awesome too. So that's what I'm reading. And um the authors who like really supported me when when I start first started out was um, Deborah Glass, and um, like she came to speak when I was uh, in RWA chapter here in Birmingham, and she was one of the speakers and didn't know me like she was there speaking, multi published already, and I had just you know raised my hand and, and asked a question, and afterwards she volunteered just to read my first three chapters. And she's like, go ahead and send them to me. And I'm like, really? And after that, she put in a word at, you know, her publisher, go and send it in. I'm putting in a word with my editor. She didn't have to do any of that. And we became critique partners and just same thing with Jessica Lee. And um, we're still great friends. And, and Deborah Glass still reads my, critiques my books to this day. And then um, Dahlia Rose has been wonderful. Um, she is, I mean, I don't know how many books she's written, but when I first started out, she was insanely multi-published and I, I mean, crazy multi-published. And for me to be able to call her friend and for her is, was just amazing to me. And we eventually became through Jessica Lee, we started doing, um, writing challenges together, like 1K writing challenges together every day. And it was, and it wasn't even every day, it was maybe like three times a week and being accountable to each other. And to this day, six years later, Dolly and I are still doing writing challenges from 10 to five every day, 1K to day. And she is my absolute best friend. And we support each other, we encourage each other, we celebrate each other. She just gave me a puppy for my release day yesterday. <laughs> I've posted, we're Lord of Ring nerds together. Matter of fact, she named the puppy Thorn Oakenshield. Mm -hmm. Love it. And I know, and um, I mean, I adore her. And so that's one of the cool things about this, this industry is you can find lifelong friends who, you know, not only do you just have things in common with, but like the, the sisterhood in here is like fierce. And she's one of them. So I love her to death. I don't know if she's watching this, but I love you. <laughs> <laughs> that is wonderful and uh, a wonderful note to end on, though I'm sad to have to end. This has really been such a great night. I've enjoyed every minute of talking to the three of you about your books. I enjoyed your books very much. Um, folks at home, the books are Careless Whis Whispers by Sanithia Williams. Then There Was You by Mona Shroff. And The Road to, Road to Rosebend by Naima Simone. You can order them all at Northshire.com. Um, for those of you uh, at home, you can find the buy links in your confirmation email from this event, and Davith has just put them in the chat. Um, thank you all so much for being here. And ladies, thank you so much for taking the time to do this tonight. It was really a great pleasure for me to get to talk to you. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, and have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.